epistle for this feast of the Pentecost is from the book of the Acts. When the days of Pentecost were drawing to a close, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a violent wind blowing. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them parted tongues as a fire which settled upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in foreign tongues, even as the Holy Spirit prompted them to speak. And they were staying at Jerusalem, devout Jews from every nation under heaven. When this sound was heard, the multitude gathered and were bewildered in mind, because each heard them speaking in his own language. But they were all amazed and marveled, saying, Behold, are not all these that are speaking Galileans? And how have we heard each his own language in which he was born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and inhabitants of Mesopotamia, Judea, the Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, Jews also and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We have heard them speaking in our own languages of the wonderful works of God. Continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. John. At that time Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone love me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him. We will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. The word that you have heard is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These sayings I have spoken to you while yet dwelling with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your mind whatever I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Do not let your heart be troubled or be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I go away, and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would indeed rejoice, and I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it comes to pass, when it has come to pass, you may believe. I will no longer speak much with you, for the Prince of the world is coming, and in me, He has nothing, but he comes that the world may know that I love the Father, and that I do as the Father has commanded me. Such are the words of the Holy Gospel according to St. John. name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this Mass is offered for the worthy intentions of Stephen Foster, not the composer. Pentecost, we celebrate today, was originally a harvest festival. For the Jews, it gradually became a feast of thanksgiving to God. Uh, for the harvest, yes, but especially for the law that he had given to the people of Israel on Mount Sinai through Moses. God, as we know, used that law to prepare a harvest for heaven of his chosen people. It's only fitting when Christ came along uh, that he, as he did with the Jewish Passover, he should elevate the Feast of Pentecost meaning with the coming of the Holy Spirit who affects through Christians, that is through the church, the harvest of new Christians, and the harvest of Christians who have become re-inspired with his love and the love of all. In the books of Acts, it is mentioned, several things are mentioned. First off, it's the third hour. So it's about nine o'clock in the morning. And that was the time 
one of the main times when people went to the temple to pray. So there was a loud noise as wind and fire. Father Kurtz uh, commenting on this says it recalls the theophanies of God to Moses on Mount Sinai and centuries later to the exiled prophet Elijah uh, on the same mountain. Theophany is some kind of spectacular showing of God himself not to be a tific vision, but uh, in, in some way that is unforgettable and unmistakable. St. Paul got knocked off that mule on the way to Damascus. He had a theophany. Jesus Christ himself showed himself to him. So uh, this is calling, recalling back that time. And there's so many things, if you notice it, where the, so many times where the, um, uh, Old Testament prefigures what happens in the New Testament to bring it all to fulfillment. So the Holy Spirit comes to the apostles and those with them, and that coming is marked by a wind. The wind uh, uh, is a, an image in Genesis and elsewhere in the Old Testament of the presence of God's Spirit. God breathed upon the waters. You notice during our Mass when the priest is uh, saying the words of consecration over the bread and the wine, he leans over. It's not because I'm resting, it's because I'm breathing into it. In the person of Jesus Christ, I'm breathing uh, life into that bread and wine through the power of the Holy Spirit, of course. So, uh, it the fact that it's marked by wind also shows us the Holy Spirit is irresistible. Who can stop the wind? Who can stop the wind? Jesus tells Nicodemus at night, the Holy Spirit blows where he will. So in, uh, uh, we also see the fire. Fire, we know, is purifying, among other things. And the Holy Spirit, likewise, is purifying. I think it's uh, Prophet Malachi that says the one, the anointed one is coming and he will refine people like refiner's fire. And so it's a purifying fire. The, uh, we often think of the, uh, the blessings out of the traditional ritual that frequently will uh, like the blessing of water, there will be a, a recitation of the coming of Jesus Christ at the end of time to judge the world per ignum, that is, by fire. So, so he will bring total purification at that time. And, again, and the tongues of fire, the fact that they break into tongues of fire, of course, is pointing to the gift of tongues that was given primarily to the early church uh, to both show and empower the apostles to evangelize peoples of all nations and all tongues, all languages. Jesus had said that the apostles would evangelize to the ends of the earth. Uh, their witness in different languages is the initial fulfillment of that promise and it has yet to stop. The tongues uh, here also is a reversal of the great calamity at the Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel, if you recall, in the Old Testament is that great monument to the pride of men. We are going to be King Nimrod. Uh, we are going to uh, build this tower so high that I, Nimrod, will be an equal to God. Of course, echoing what uh, Lucifer had said himself when he rebelled. So that's why the punishment was different languages and this is a beginning of that punishment for a terrible sin. So that so those who are not trying to be their own gods can find real communion with the true God and with others. We put that silly dream behind us we can have a real communion with God. 
The devil uh, sows division. God replaces that with unity. Unity with, between us and him, unity with one another. Many of the places mentioned where the hearers were from, all these different country, tongue-twisting countries that you hear, uh, rattle, uh, uh, the people rattling off in this uh, first the, the, uh, epistle today, uh, a lot of times these countries either contemporary or former enemies the Israelites. So there's a, a, there's a definite tone of reconciliation that comes with the Spirit. One thinks a little bit ahead to the deacon Philip who goes to Samaria, a place hated by the Jews, uh, reciprocally by my dad, and, uh, and preaches the gospel and the, the rejoicing the gospel said, the uh, act says, uh, was raised to fever pitch in Samaria. There was all this excitement about the new way, about Jesus Christ. So this is, it shows that Christianity would be the only true universal religion, applicable to all peoples and all times, since it embodies the essence of reality. Now I have to add in here, uh, you can really enjoy reading from the book of Acts sometimes because it shows people of which we are a part uh, at their best and also at their worst. Um, some of the people who are the verses immediately following the parts we had today, there's some people in the audience who mock the, the apostles and say these guys are drunk on new wine. And Peter's response is, it's only nine in the morning, which kind of sounds like, well, you know, give them till noon, then they'll be drunk. But you know, it always sounded kind of strange to me. Uh, but uh, that, that shows us something because oddly enough, it's true. They were drunk on new wine. New wine in the Old Testament symbolized the joys and the blessings that would come uh, from the Messianic age, from the uh, arrival of the Messiah. So um, Jesus used it to refer to, it frequently himself, to refer to the divine life that we would ultimately be giving, given if we are faithful. It's like new wine. We look at the gospel and we see that even though reaching to every place person and time in the world, the Holy Spirit's power is only able to work fruitfully to the extent that people accept him. He will not force us. The indwelling of the Trinity, which is mentioned in the gospel today and has also been the subject for the last few uh, Sundays in the gospel, in this farewell discourse at the Last Supper, this indwelling of the Trinity through the Spirit's power uh, has been dealt with. And we see that one who has Jesus' commandments of love, as the Gospel today says, and keeps them, that is the one that loves Jesus. A lot of people say, I love Jesus, and they don't keep the commands, the commands that we hear through the church. And so, uh, but real loving of Jesus will bring on this indwelling of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But the indwelling has to be reciprocal. We have to be willing to and wanting to live in the Lord, which means live in Jesus Christ. Uh, he is our link with God. And uh, if we don't obey, if we don't, or if we don't love, there's no true indwelling. And you have to ask yourselves, particularly on the obey, the question, what about the so-called supermarket Catholics? The ones that, well, I accept this teaching and this teaching, but not this one. It's a real, it's a genuine question to be asked. And if you happen to be one of those, ask it of yourselves. The Lord calls for obedience. 
Jesus says, the prince of this world is coming, but he has nothing in me. In other words, Christ has given the devil no opening, no hook within himself, because in him there's no presence of evil. Uh, this is uh, an important principle for us. If we want God to come to us, we have to use his power, call on his power, to help us sweep up, to clean up, uh, to get whatever is an obstacle within us out, or at least reduce it, because usually it takes more than one cleaning. Um, it's uh, something that we should be doing, and we do, in our, even in our standard prayers, we should be doing this every single day, asking for the Lord's help to put us, for us to put aside whatever distracts us from him, uh, whatever is, uh, is hurtful to him, whatever he doesn't, uh, whatever he sees in us that is dark. That purity of heart, we are trying to imitate. We cannot do it without the help of the Holy Spirit. So it all comes around. It's just, the street runs both ways, as they say. We try to... That, that level of perfection that Christ had, of course, is going to be beyond us, but we need to imitate it just as much as we can using the power of the Spirit. The presence of God's Spirit within us makes each of us, as we so often heard, a temple of the Holy Spirit. And our temple has to be kept swept clean. Finally, the gift of the Holy Spirit is a continual giving. It's a gift that keeps on giving. One thinks back even to the creation itself. A lot of times you say, well, the, cre the creation, with a capital C, that was a one-time thing, and it was. But it's ongoing. Christ, it, God, keeps us in being each and every day. And he's always trying to nudge us towards the light, towards doing the good. Creation didn't stop eons ago when God made the physical universe. Creation is ongoing. If it weren't, whatever he created would disappear. If it were possible for God to forget what he created, it would just not be anymore. So it's an ongoing thing. Likewise, the love of the Holy Spirit and the, the sanctification efforts are continuing action. So we see it in time uh, through the sacraments especially, but the Holy Spirit's also there with every sincere act of repentance and conversion, forgiveness or sacrifice that we, that we commit. And each time we respond to his charitable inspiration, he fills us with even more of his love. I hope everybody, except maybe the very youngest, have discovered this by now. When you do something that is good, you feel good about it. You may be tired, you may be wiped out, but you feel good about it. And that's not just an emotional reaction, that is more charity coming up saying, Let's do one more. Let's do this again. Let's do this better the next time. Whatever it is, that, that's the Holy Spirit working too. Traditional rites, I have to say, by way of slight digression, touch us in our entire being. I was thinking about, I've been thinking about that stuff a lot since last, about a year ago, as a matter of fact. Um, the senses, the emotions, the will, and the mind, these things are, are touched at the traditional Latin Mass or in the traditional rites in a way that makes us very responsive if we're paying attention at all, if we're, if we're getting into the Mass and praying the Mass with the priest, then it, it opens us and makes us more responsive. It's what opera is to, to uh, secular music. Opera has everything in it. The art, the symmetry, the coordination, all these different things. Uh, a lot of good singing from up there and some other singing. 
And, uh, uh, you know, it's got all of these things to touch our whole being, to draw us towards God. I think that's why so many people who are new to this Mass, after they've been to it a time or two, they say, I feel like I've touched God, or I feel like I have been touched by God. You have. Father Gabriel says the giving of the Holy Spirit is a fullness, the completion of God's work of redemption of humanity. The incarnation, the, the ministry, the death, the resurrection, the ascension, and now the coming of the Holy Spirit to continue Christ's presence with us in its church and in its sacraments and to do so for all time. May God bless you. In the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.